Hi everyone, Sandman here. This video is brought to you by a donation from Proto Mario, and here's what he has to say. Hi Sandman, my name is Proto Mario. I run a YouTube channel for gaming. I'd like you to review the movie Sin City A Dame for a Kill. I think you understand why, and I think you'll actually enjoy the bodyguard in this particular film. Well Proto Mario, thanks for your donation as well as your topic. I put the link to your channel in the description in case anyone wants to check it out. I'm impressed that you almost have half a million subscribers. Anyways, let me get on with the review of Sin City, A Dame to Kill For. Proto Mario, you wanted me to comment specifically on the character of Ava. In the film A Dame to Kill For, she plays every single man in the film like a marionette puppet right to the end. She's married to a guy called Damien and she's playing the part of the princess for him. You see that throughout the entire film she ends up playing the role of the woman that the man wants. She is the female chameleon changing her behavior to manipulate men. So Mrs. Ava Lord is a kept woman with her husband paying for a bodyguard to follow her around and make sure that she doesn't cheat on him or do something stupid. Yes, Mario, I did enjoy his performance, but at the same time I kept getting this funny urge to buy car insurance. I'm not sure what that's all about. Before this film was made, there was talk that Angelina Jolie was going to take the lead, but instead it went to Ava Green, the woman from the first James Bond film with Daniel Craig, and she was also most recently in the series Penny Dreadful. She has that whole creepy yet bitchy thing going on for her. She appears as evil and beautiful both at the same time. So her plan in this film, and be warned there are spoilers, is to take an old lover named Dwight and use him to kill her rich husband so she can be free of him. Dwight also remarks that she's the rich man's wife that she always intended to be. So she seduces him and then he takes a beating when he comes to her house looking for her. After that, she comes back to his place after her operatives beat the crap out of him. She says that she wants him because he's willing to risk his life for her and he's the bad boy that she left behind. But according to Dwight, and I quote, in the end, she owns him body and soul. After doing the horizontal mamba together, her bodyguard finds them together and beats the crap out of Dwight and takes her back to her husband. But in the end, Ava gets everyone around her to run around and do tricks, and Dwight even kills Damien Lord, her husband, so she can keep his money. He even tells her that she's pathological. She responds by saying that sex always makes you stupid, willing to do anything. She also says to him that this is the last time she thinks about being with a man. She shows the real nature of the female animal treating men as disposable beasts. I think her performance is much better than anything that Angelina Jolie could have done, but that is still not enough to doom this film to box office failure. But nonetheless, Jolie has that same crazy look in her eye, and if she wanted to, she could have done this film too. I find it ironic when Ava remarks that she's never going to have to service another man sexually ever again, and how she's looking forward to that. But later on, she uses sex once again on a cop to convince him to kill Damien. She can't help but use her seductive powers to control men. She cries up a storm to the police, and the cops say to one another that there's nothing like a widow that needs comforting. But what they don't realize is that she's actually a black widow. She manipulates one of the cops to buy her side of the story that Dwight ended up killing her husband because of jealousy. Ava then has sex with him and shames him by saying that if he ever wants to get together with her again, he's going to have to kill Dwight. According to her bodyguard, Ava is the goddess that makes slaves of all men. Probably him as well, but we never actually get to see that. She projects the illusion that drives men mad. The cop even kills his own partner because of her and himself. Dwight finally realizes that she's a witch and predator that sometimes destroys men for power, profit, and sport. Even men that don't want sex, she knows how to manipulate them using corporate mergers and acquisitions. Near the end of this drama, we see her with a man that looks like he's a monster, and she doesn't care she's willing to manipulate him by using potential mergers and acquisitions with his company. Also, there's so many scenes in this film where she prances around naked, and Dwight comments that for Ava, bathing nude is never about bathing, it's always about theater. Eventually, Dwight returns to Ava's mansion looking for revenge and ends up killing her and watches the life drain from her green eyes. Even to the bitter end, she tries to seduce Dwight and we know that eventually she will turn on him and kill him. Luckily, he finally breaks free of her spell and kills her instead. It's a great moment where we realize that if a man has the willpower, he can beat the manipulation of female nature. Before any of this stuff happens between Dwight and Ava, we learn that Dwight is a freelance photographer hired by a woman to take photos of her husband cheating on her so she can divorce him and take him to the cleaners. The husband in this case is played by Ray Liotta. As Dwight stands at a skylight, we see him taking pictures of Ray Liotta's character getting ready to kill his mistress because he realizes that she's going to suck him dry the same way that his wife did. 
Then suddenly, Dwight jumps in through the window to save her like a cowboy white knight. One moment the mistress is screaming, don't kill me, at Ray Liotta, and the next she's telling Brolin's character to kill Ray Liotta's character instead. How's that for a two-faced dame? She expects to get mercy for her own life, but when her lover is in the same position, there's no mercy for him. Dwight doesn't end up killing this woman named Sally, but he still delivers the photos of infidelity to the lawyer in Ray Liotta's wife. That's when we see the greedy lawyer and Ray Liotta's wife plan to destroy his life. What I find interesting is why couldn't they have just shown the infidelity and left it at that, but they have to show Liotta as a potential murderer to establish some sense of sympathy for his wife, because otherwise she would be just as big a monster as he is. That's the one thing I never liked about the Sin City franchise, and I say franchise because after the poor performance in the second part, where they didn't even make their money back, I don't think there'll be a part three. But the simping and white knighting is there, and at one point Dwight is told that Ava pretends to be the damsel in distress all the time to get Dwight to do exactly what she wants him to do. Then we have another side story in this film involving Rourke and his son Johnny, played by Joseph Gordon Lovett. And Joseph is a real mangina in his day-to-day life and probably also a feminist. In this story, Johnny has amazing luck at gambling and always wins with Lady Luck. We see him putting money into a slot machine and then cash pops out. He lives recklessly because he thinks his luck will never run out. Then one night he decides to make a fool of the big card shark, Rourke. He wins and then while he's spending his winnings with a girl named Marcy, he gets cocky and he actually gets her killed. His father, Rourke, also beats him, shoots him, and has all the fingers in his right hand broken to teach him a lesson. And then he leaves him for dead. That's one way for a father to tell his son to scram. If Rourke was smart, he would have seen the potential in Johnny, his son, and employed him doing something, but instead, he just gets rid of him. Then Johnny comes back and shows up at the poker table a second time and beats his father once again to prove that he's the better man. This teaches us the lesson that competition among men is always forever present, even when it's between father and son, brother and brother, or just about any other possible male-to-male relationship. He tells his father that everyone will now know that he's better than his father, and that's when Rourke shoots him and leaves him for dead. Proto Mario, I must say that the first time I watched this film, the whole act seemed like it was actually completely pointless. It didn't tie into the main story of the film. Perhaps Johnny comes back to beat his father because he's trying to get revenge for Marcy's killing. But it's more than likely he just didn't think his father was going to kill him, so that's why he went back. But as I was saying, the storyline here is completely useless in the film, and it probably would have been better if it was cut out. The last part of the film involves everyone's favorite Jessica Alba stripper Nancy from the first film. If you'll recall, she was saved White Knight Styles in the first film by John Hartigan, played by Bruce Willis. After that, he commits suicide, so we see him walking around the film as a ghost. After his suicide, Nancy goes crazy over the course of the next four years, and eventually blames Rourke for the suicide, and then plans on getting revenge, claiming that she was in love with John Hartigan, which in my opinion is just sloppy writing for someone that doesn't understand female nature. So then Nancy cuts her face up and gets Marv to help her kill Rourke because she basically tricks him into thinking that it was Rourke that cut her face up. She plays the perfect victim by wounding herself to get a man's touch and help. It throws everyone off when she says that she loves Bruce Willis' character. It's kind of pervy and it also takes the relationship from being more about father-daughter to actually a full-blown relationship. Nancy also being a woman would never have cut up her face the same way that she did because it would ruin her ability to make money off men whilst working at a strip club or anywhere else for that matter. People weren't expecting that. Especially considering that she was written as the ideal dream woman first, and then she changes into the typical woman manipulating Marv and going crazy. She manipulates Marv and even takes the lead and goes into Rourke's mansion first and kills all the bad guys before getting wounded. In the end, we see John Hartigan's force ghost in the mirror distracting Rourke long enough for Nancy to shoot him dead. That pretty much sums up the women in this film and how they manipulate the men into doing the things for them that they want. But even with all of that, this film fails because of the gap between the sequels, lack of humor, no Clive Owen, and the sloppy story and bad ending. I wish it was as high paced as the first one and put a lot more humor into it like they did in the first film with the character Marv. I also think that Marv died while sitting in the electric chair on the first film, so why is he in this one? It obviously takes place after the first film because Hardigan is dead, so I don't know the exact timeline because it's rather confusing. There's also the stupid inclusion of Lady Gaga as a waitress. Are you kidding me? Was that really the best that they could do? Why didn't they write her as a transgendered assassin that's packing a big load instead of a greasy spoon granny? Maybe she could have been Miho's lover, and who knows, the two of them could have actually gone sword fighting in bed or something like that. This film does have its cool moments, but I had forgotten that I'd ever watched it a long time ago. As I said, I think they sat on this sequel for way too long before releasing it. It took them almost 10 years to release a sequel, and it was released in August, which is the month that many movies go to die. If they put it out in the spring like the first part, I'm sure it would have done a lot better. They also could have tried to stylize it a little bit more. 
In the first part, the acting was a lot better, and I don't know if they got lazy or sloppy, but this film might have actually killed the franchise, because I don't think they're going to make part three, although I keep hearing rumors. Before re-watching this film for this review, the only two things I could remember clearly were Johnny getting killed for no reason at all, and also how Ava Green was swimming nude in all those scenes. Other than that, this film doesn't really have any redeeming qualities besides her acting. If you guys want to watch an interesting film with Ava Green, then I suggest you watch a film called Womb, where her lover is killed, and then she chooses to clone her lover and raise him as her own son because she supposedly loves him so much. The way she fucks up the male clone is something that needs to go down, and the history books is one of the dumbest technological fails ever. Anyways, that's all I've got to say for today. Thanks again, Proto Mario, for your donation as well as your topic request. Also, congrats on the continued success of your channel. Don't forget to check out the MGTOW mystery link and also like this video. As for everyone else out there, please follow me on Twitter or like me on Facebook to get tomorrow's video today. Thanks for taking your daily dose of red pills. And remember, a red pill a day keeps the Allstate commercials guy away. So enjoy the rest of your day and cheers.